morning, church. How you doing? Did you have a good week? Did the right team win last night? Yeah. I'm talking about the footy. All right. And I'll let you know, I still and have always believed in miracles. But anyway, if you stayed up till midnight, you understand that. If you didn't, uh, anyway, you're, you're better off than I am now because you're not tired. Anyway, you know, as we process that, there's a lot of people that are excited about the election. And uh, there's other people probably sitting close to you that are a bit disappointed. And, you know, as I process all that, the, the good thing that we can take away from any election is the reality that God says he raises up the leaders in this world. And whatever happens, whether you're excited today or whether you're thinking, oh, my goodness, my life is going to be a, a shambles today, God's in control. How good is that? didn't matter who was going to win because God is in control. And I think that's awesome. Hey, I need your help. Uh, or Actually, I just want to give you an update probably uh, on my grandparenting. Most of you know I became a grandfather in December last year. And uh, it, it's a joyful journey and it's wonderful and, and all of that. And I was talking with Hattie. She's my granddaughter this week. And she started talking back, and I think I've already told you before, she talks, and we have great conversations. My, and my, her words consist of, ooh, coo, ah, you know, that, that kind of thing. And with every ooh and ah and grunt, we get excited, right? It's like, that's so cute. And then what do we do? We do that back to them, right? If they go, ooh, we go, ooh, and, and, and we try to get them to do it more and things. And I was thinking, I was sitting there thinking, well, while I'm doing this, having this conversation with my granddaughter, I thought, She's actually probably way more intelligent than I realize at the moment. And she's probably thinking, if she could articulate it, why are you doing that? That's the best I can do right now. That's all I can do to form, try to form words is the oohs and ahs. But you are better than that. You could do better, and I need to learn from you. So stop it and help me learn real words. I, I imagined her actually having that conversation with me. And the, we, we think uh, kids talking is so cute and, 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 that, and then when they become toddlers and they start really talking, saying words, and then they go out in public and they repeat words that you might have said at home. Uh-oh. Right? Right? You like that? Right? Not my kids, of course. Think in, the same con in that context. Thinking about kids and their talking. Think about our prayer life in that context. Have you ever listened to the prayers of a new believer. I love it. If you're sitting with a new believer and, and, they, and they're bold enough to pray, it, it's, it's awesome because it's real and it's honest and it's raw. And they're just talking to God, saying what they think, saying what's on their mind and what's on, on their heart because they haven't learned how you're meant to pray yet. You know? You know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever listen to a new believer pray? Okay. Are we awake today? Do we need to sing some more or something like that? Because if you're already asleep, that's not my fault, all right? If at the end you are, yeah, I can take credit for that. But anyway, when we listen to new believers, it, it, it's awesome. And uh, have you ever heard those people that pray really good? Yeah, I remember about 25 years ago, I was in a church, and there was this uh, uh, older gentleman. He was a seasoned saint, and he had this deep, booming voice, which I can't even replicate. I'm going to try a little bit, but anyway. And he knew how to pray. And when he would pray, it would go something like this. <clears throat> and he would speak in Old English, by the way, because that's the way I think he thought we were supposed to pray. And he would say, oh, thou most highly exalted one. He needed no PA system or anything like that. We entereth into thy presence and exalteth thee. As we beseech thee, cometh into this holy place to commune with us. Dearest Father, we boweth tonight before thee, whilst you sitteth upon thy throne in the heavenlies. We prayeth for our brother who is weak and sickly amongst us, that thou would provide healing for his body, and that thou, almighty God, wouldst bringeth restoration to his soul, which hath wandered far away from thy presence. I had to write that down because I couldn't have done it without that. Anyway. Have you heard those kinds of prayers? Prayers, people who pray, right, right? 
fun, isn't it? It's kind of amusing. And we could have a long list of people that pray in different ways and, and, and how that comes. And sometimes it's amusing, but sometimes it's intimidating. How many of you know people that won't pray in public? Even in a small group, like a life group. How many of you are people? Don't, don't raise your hand. But lots of you. Lots of us are people that we're uncomfortable with that because we've heard people do the professional praying. And we're like, oh, I'm not going to get it right if I try to pray, right? Can you relate? Many times we're afraid we won't get it right. But there are a host of other reasons that people won't pray out loud. They don't want to pray in a group of people. And uh, uh, I think it's safe to say, for the most part, Prayer is lacking in the life of most believers because of a, a myriad of reasons. And there's a hashtag me too on that. Our lack of understanding or our fear has made prayer quite possibly the most undertapped resource, most underutilized weapon God has given us in the Christian life. And I would suggest to you that we can't afford to let our fear of not knowing what to say, or our lack of understanding, stop us from praying. For this very reason, James chapter 5 says this, The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. Let that sink in for a minute. Think about that. My favorite part in that passage is where it says, Elijah was a human, was as human as we are. Elijah was just like you, just like me. And when he prayed, God moved. Do we believe that? Do we understand the resource that we have right there at our fingertips? And I, I know it, it feels like I'm already in the middle of a message, almost at the end, because I'm so excited about this. This whole message is going to be like that, by the way. John 17 is amazing. I'm almost scared to preach it. Phil told me he was scared to preach it. He's preaching next week because it, it is so awesome. But do, do you comprehend the power that is available to us? Elijah was as human as you are, as I am. But yet when he prayed, it didn't rain for three years. And he prayed again, and I imagine he prayed lots of times in between. The heavens sent the rain. That amazes me. Imagine if we got a hold of that, the prayer of normal people producing that kind of results. See, I think sometimes we think prayer is reserved for those elite prayers like I was talking about earlier or uh, the pastor. You know, people invite me around and uh, we'll have dinner or, or whatever or just randomly because anytime the pastor's there, oh, could we pray, you know? And by the way, the pastor is not always the one that has to pray. No special connection different than yours. We're all high priests. We all have access to prayer, all right? But we think that somehow... Somebody way more spiritual than I am, somebody that knows how to pray a lot better than I do, their prayers are going to be more effective. It's available to everyone. I think sometimes we also may struggle because we're not even sure what to pray for. You have that problem sometimes? You know you want to pray, I've got the time, I'm here, I'm ready, we're going to, we're going to pray now. It's like, okay, now what? Yep. God bless Aunt Susie. Mom and dad and the kids and you know, now what? I think we struggle sometimes not really knowing what to pray for. How about this? How about someone ask you, how can I pray for you? You ever have that? And you have no idea what to say. I ask people, hey, how can I be praying for you? And they look at me with a blank face sometimes. Like, praise God, your life is so great. You don't need any prayer. That's awesome. I can tick that one off my list as your pastor and we can move on. One of Jesus' closest friends, John, listened to a prayer that Jesus prayed, and he wrote it down for us. We've got it recorded 
in John chapter 17 in our New Testament. Two weeks ago, Pastor Justin kicked off a series, Praying Like Jesus. And he reminded us that, uh, or pointed us to the reality that the faith of our prayers is anchored in none other than Jesus. He also gave us a great little tool to use, the acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, to help us understand how to pray. Today we're going to pick up that same prayer in John 17 where, where he wrote it down for us. And we're going to see how Jesus prayed for other people. And as we look at how Jesus prayed for people, we need to stop for a second and realize the magnitude of that. Jesus praying for people. Jesus was praying specifically, we're going to talk about his disciples today, but he was praying for us as well. Imagine Jesus praying for you. And he prayed then in John 17 when he was still on the earth, but he also is still in heaven right now, this very moment, praying for you. Praying for me. How cool is that? I'm thinking we're not understanding this to, here, here today, the, the, how, how, how great this is, how, how, how serious this is. Jesus is in heaven praying for you and I. I can't get my head around that, but I know it's awesome. I know it's amazing. See, Jesus, in, the, in John 17, when he's praying for people, this actually marks a transition in his ministry from his earthly ministry to his current ministry. So he had done all the miracles and everything, and then we know that he is about to be crucified and raised from the dead. But this prayer marks a transition. This gives us a glimpse of what he's doing for you and I right now, how he's praying for us. So as we think about how we pray for each other, how I want people praying for me, I want to look at how Jesus prayed for people. I want to share with you how Jesus prayed for people, so that will help us pray for each other more. All right, you ready to come on this journey? Look at verse 6. It says, I have revealed you to the ones who gave, you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me. Because they belong to you. Jesus' prayer here for his disciples gives us some insight into how we can pray for others and how we can engage people to pray for us. And the first thing we need to realize and understand, when we start praying for people, or when I ask you to pray for me or you start praying for me, we need to understand that the people we are praying for are God's possession. The people we are praying for are God's possessions. You see that in those verses. See, Jesus is acknowledging he says, God, you gave them to me from out of the world. These were normal, everyday, ordinary people in the world, and you gave them to me. They are yours. They're not mine, they're yours. So I'm praying for your possessions, your children. There was nothing special about them that caused them to earn God's favor. God had chosen them and given them to Jesus, and they had responded to that gift of grace, that invitation to follow Jesus. Interestingly, Jesus describes those. He says, I'm praying for those that you've given me, and they are obedient. They have obeyed your word. And I started thinking about that because we've been through the whole book of John now. And I thought, did they always obey? Were they always spot on in their following of Jesus? Because the way Jesus is describing it to the Father, he's saying, hey, these guys are my right-hand people. They, they, they love me. They're following me. They're doing everything right. They are obedient. But as I recall, they had plenty of moments of doubt and confusion, plenty of moments of failure where they didn't uh, trust him enough. In fact, he even told them on a couple of occasions, oh, you of little faith, you need more faith. He declared them to the Father as obedient children. And as I processed that, I thought, you know, while they're not yet mature in their faith, they've made a decision. They've acknowledged that Jesus is the Messiah. Because that's what all this is leading up from before we got to here. They've acknowledged that Jesus is the Messiah. They've taken that step of faith, and Jesus says, that's obedience. They chose to follow me. They are obedient children. I also reckon we could conclude that Jesus saw something in them that we didn't see. 
and that maybe they didn't see in themselves. He saw their capacity. He believed in their capacity to trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but trust and obey. He believed that about them. Some of you that are missing your hymns, you should be really excited right now. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. You know, we're talking about praying for those who are following Jesus. Jesus says in this text, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for followers. I'm praying for those that are following me, the ones you have given me. And as, I think about, as we think about how to pray for each other, it's good for us to remember something that Jesus said about his disciples. They were like us, given to him from outside the world. They didn't have it all together yet. And like us, the people we're praying for may still have doubts and questions. They still may fail from time to time, probably more often than not. But if they've been obedient in following Jesus, they are obedient children, possessions of God. That's a big relief for me when I pray for you, when I pray for my family, when I pray for my kids. Because sometimes the burdens are heavy. Sometimes when you are really connected with someone, you really love people, and you're praying for them, it gets really heavy. But recognizing that they're God's possession is so freeing. It's so freeing. Because I can still pray passionately, but, you know, they are his, and he actually loves them more than I do. I got a granddaughter, and I can't imagine God loving her more than I do right now, all right? But he does. And that, that's awesome. That, she's going to be so spoiled. God's going to spoil her. <laughs> They're his responsibility, not yours, not mine. It's not my responsibility to even fix all the problems that I'm praying for. It's also not my responsibility to judge them for the things I think they're doing wrong and because they haven't arrived yet. Because they are God's possession. They are his obedient children if they've chosen to follow Jesus. And as I pray for them, you know, the other assurance I can have is I pray for you. And as you pray for me and each other, knowing they're God's possession, you know what else that tells us? He has an interest. He is going to listen to that prayer. He wants to hear that prayer because he has a vested interest in seeing that prayer come to pass. Because they are his children. Verse 11, as he prays, he says to the Father, he says, Now I'm departing from the world. They are staying in this world. But I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. The people that we pray for, the people Jesus is praying for here, the disciples, need protection. The people we pray for need protection. Jesus says, I'm leaving, they're staying. Imagine that. Jesus is leaving them, and we, we, we know the rest of the story already. He spent three years with them, and he's been teaching them and training them and giving them uh, hands-on, uh, an apprenticeship, if you will, with him. And he says, now I'm leaving. He had 11 followers. 11. Yeah, I actually thought I was going to hold up 11 fingers for a second, but yeah, didn't work. He says, I was here with them. I spent three years with them. And now these guys are going to carry on the mission. And he prayed with great hope for them. Now, if I'm Jesus, and I just spent three years, and I got 11 guys, they were all guys. I had 12, but then one of them sold me out, and now he's gone. And I'm praying to the Father, and I know I'm about to die on the cross. I know I'm going to be, I, I know be in the end game, but I'm thinking, really? You're going to take me out and leave it with these 11 blokes? Come on. Seriously? That would be my, my, my attitude. But Jesus saw it differently because he believed in God. And he believed in people. And he said, you give me those 11. You gave me those 11. And now you protect them. And we're going to change the world with those 11 people. Jesus believes in people. Jesus believes in you. He believes in me. Even when you and I don't believe in ourselves. How good is that? Anybody struggle believing in yourself sometimes? Both hands are up for me. Yeah. 
Jesus believed in you. He believed in me. And Jesus is saying here, he says, I'm not going to be present. And actually, you think about it, Jesus is saying, hey, my troubles are going to be gone. Yeah, it's going to get rough for about three or four days here. But uh, after that, it's all good. I'm going to be back in heaven. And I'm leaving them here. Father, they need your protection. Because I've been here to protect them while I was in the world. That's verse 12. And I've given them your word. And they've done well with me while I could teach it to them. That's verse 14. But I'm leaving. They're going to need your protection because they're going to be in the world and the world's going to hate them. When we're talking about the world, we're talking about the world system, the world attitude, society. Who knows society actually hates Jesus and Christianity? Do you see that around us? Jesus said that's the way it was going to be. And the disciples were about to be facing some severe conflicts, some within themselves, some from the outside. When we think about the, the disciples, they're going to be facing temptations, temptations to walk away. They're going to be facing sorrow and grief. Some of them are going to be afraid and want to run away. He names Judas as an example in verse 12. He said, hey, I've, I've kept all of them you gave me. Oh, except Judas because he was, uh, the scripture said he was going to run away from me. And then they would be attacked by Satan. In verse 15, he says, protect them from the evil one. We know in a very short time from this, from this prayer that the disciples are listening to. Imagine hearing Jesus pray this over you. That Peter was going to deny Jesus three times. And the rest of the disciples were going to desert him and, and run away at the crucifixion. Peter had a huge grasp of what this meant. When, when Jesus says, Father, protect them from the evil one. Peter had firsthand experience what that meant. If you think about Peter, he denied Jesus, then he was restored. And he later went on to anchor that early church. And then he wrote a couple of letters to people. And in one of those letters, Peter said these words. And as he wrote these words, I can imagine he, him reflecting back to his own failure. The time when he said, no, I don't know Jesus. And he said this, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. And I know it firsthand. So stay alert. Be on guard. Be careful. The Apostle Paul understood the, the same thing in Ephesians chapter 6. He says this, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Jesus prayed for their protection. As I thought about that, when we pray for protection, you, you, I pray for protection for my kids. I pray for protection for, for you guys and things. What does that actually even mean? Or where does protection come from? Jesus said, protect them in your name. Or protect them by your name. I thought about these disciples, these uh, young Jewish guys who would have just come out of Judaism and they're, now they're following Jesus. And Jesus is saying, God, protect them by your name. You know what the disciples would have heard? They would have heard about all the character of God when he said that. They would have heard that God is Jehovah Elohim, the all-powerful God. They would have heard he was El Shaddai, God Almighty. They would have heard he was El Elyon, God Most High. They would have heard that he said, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. They would have heard him as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is my shepherd. And as he guides and protects. And they would have heard this. We're talking about this, this battle they're going to be engaged with in the world. They would have heard Jehovah Sabaoth, which means Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's armies. That would have been a reminder to them that he fights our battles. He wins our wars. And he gives us refuge when we run to him in time of need. That's what they would have understood. So it's not just protect them in your name. The name of God is so powerful. It means so much. He has all of the resources of the universe. See, Jesus prayed for their protection because he knew life was going to get hard. Life had already been not so easy at times, but he was there to help them through it. Now it's going to get really hard. They're going to be martyred. They're going to be uh, tested and tested again and again. And he knew that. 
because they were following him. And Jesus knew that without protection, there would be times that they would be distraught, discouraged, depressed, and even defeated. So Jesus said, Father, protect them in your name. So Jesus calls to the almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the universe and says, protect them. All the resources of heaven to fight their battles, to give them victory, to heal their hurts, to provide peace. I was reminded yesterday, someone sent me a message in Psalm chapter 20, verse 7. It said, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. You know, when we're praying for people, when we want people to engage in prayer for us, remember, people need protection. And God is the great protector. We can't overestimate the reality of the spiritual battle that is raging for the souls of men and women around us in spiritual warfare. And as we pray for people, and as we engage that battle, we need to engage it with spiritual weapons, praying like Jesus did. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul writing says this, We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Friends, we are in a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual war. And Jesus, we're going to really unpack this more in just a minute, but he understood what the disciples were about to face. And he said, they need protection. And it's not weapons that you understand. Remember Peter chopped off the guy's ear in the garden with the sword? It's not swords we need. We need God fighting for us. That's what Jesus was calling on God to do. He prays for protection. Then in that same verse, look at uh, 17 11, it says, Now protect them by the power of your name, so they will be united just as we are. So those that we're praying for need unification. Those that you and I pray for need unification. That we may be one, just as Jesus and the Father are one. See, the Father and the Son are one in all that they say, in all that they do. The disciples needed to be one with the Father and one with the Son. They need to be in sync. They needed to be unified in mission and unified for the sake of mission. Jesus is not calling them to be uniform. This isn't about uniformity, all of them looking uh, just alike and uh, and those kinds of things. The disciples were all different. They had different backgrounds, different personalities. But he said, make them unified. Make them united. Make them united on the mission of what needs to be done. Use their uniqueness and blend that together and help them to be united around the fact that Jesus is the Messiah and there's a world out there that needs to follow him. Together. It's different, unique, but together. When I look at the world around us, even in Christianity, you ever wonder where all the thousands and thousands of denominations come from? I do. I wonder that all the time. And we've got Baptists out there on our sign and everything, and we're Werribee Baptist Church, and we're not changing that. Don't get scared. But sometimes I think about it, and I wonder, where did that come from? Because Jesus said, pray that, I pray that they'll be one, that they'll be united, they won't be divided. And most of the time in our denominationalism, it's because we can't agree on something. And we think that that is so important that we have to create another denomination. And that's happened 10,000 times over. Is that what Jesus was thinking about when he said, pray that they'll all be one? I don't think so. And I love our church. I love the diversity of our church. Because we got people way over here, that, and not in this section, but maybe in that section. Anyway, we got people on this end of the spectrum and, and things as far as being conservative and believing certain things. We got people on the other end of the spectrum. Hey, you know what? We get along. We make that work. Because Jesus said that they would all be one. I love the churches in Wyndham. 
because we don't get up in our pulpits and talk about the other churches in Wyndham and how bad they are and how good we are because we're all about the kingdom. But where did all that come from? And, you know, as I think about disrupting unity, as much as the divisiveness and denominationalism amongst Christians and infighting happens, another thing that disrupts unity in our Christian life is we treat it as something that's individual. It's a me and Jesus thing. It's very personal. And, yes, it is personal. We need a personal relationship with Jesus. But it's also communal. Most of the New Testament is written to communities of believers doing life together to teach them how to do life together. When you read Scripture through that lens, it changes everything. It's not just about me. It's not just about my needs and my wants and my desires. It's about the community and how do we function well together in unity. Jesus never intended his followers to do it alone. And if you're trying to do it alone, and by the way, most of you are here today, it means you're not trying to do it alone. But if you're only here today and you're not in life groups and not connected through the week and all that, then you're still pretty much doing it alone. If you listen to this on a podcast because you and Jesus got your thing going with your computer and that's it and you don't need people, no, that's not what Jesus designed for you. That's not what he called you to. That's not what he wants for you and, and needs for you. Protection produces unity, but unity also provides protection. We're safer together than we are apart. We're stronger together than we are divided. Imagine if every follower of Jesus on the planet were united in mission. All the infighting that goes on amongst Christians, all the debating about questionable things. Imagine if all of that energy was transferred into reaching a world that doesn't know Jesus. A lot of energy spent on that stuff. I can't imagine what God could do if we were all one as he is one. Verse 17 says, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I gave myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Finally, Jesus is praying for them to be made holy. Those we are praying for need sanctification. Now that's a $3 word that means holy. It means being set apart. It means growing. It kind of mirrors the request for protection. The request for protection says there's a lot of bad stuff going to happen in the world. They need protection from that. But they need sanctification for moving forward, for not retreating. Protection keeps us from retreating. Sanctification helps us advance. They had a mission ahead of them. They needed to be set apart for that. To be set apart by applying the truth of God's word. He said, I gave them your word and setting them apart. And as they apply God's word, it changes them. Hashtag us too. As we apply God's word, it changes us. It sets us apart. It makes us different from the world around us. Jesus' prayer for the disciples literally in our language today would be, Jesus is saying, Father, make them weird. Make them strange compared to the world around them feel weird? Do you feel weird enough? Or do you fit in? Maybe I, I think sometimes we, we might fit in too much. Maybe we're, we're, we're not yet there and we're striving to be. We know that. But Jesus said, set them apart. Make them weird. Make them strange when they compare themselves to the world. Make them love the things God loves and hate the things God hates. Make them want the things God wants. So I want to pull all this together for you as we wrap it up. Why did the disciples need to be protected, united, and sanctified? And what does that mean for you and I? Because if you're like me, you might be thinking, well, hang on, Jesus is leaving. And wouldn't it be better for the disciples? You're talking about all this protection they're going to need, and they're going to struggle with their unity, and they need to be set apart. And God, please do all that in them. Jesus, wouldn't it be better? Just take them with you now. Take all your followers now. Wouldn't it be great? Imagine when you receive Christ, the moment you receive Christ as your Savior, you said, you said yes to Jesus, following Jesus, you're gone. You're in heaven. Wouldn't that be good? Be nice. Hey, I tell you what, you're going to fail a lot less in heaven than you do on earth. You're not going to get sick in heaven. You're not going to be frustrated in heaven. And, and, and all. Wouldn't that be great? 
I used to think that way. But Jesus' prayer very explicitly said, don't do that. In verse 15, he says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. He says, don't take them out, even though I, I know it's going to be tough for them. And I know they don't belong here anymore. Don't take them out because I'm sending them on mission in the world, just like you sent me. Verse 18, they had a mission. The world needed them to stay. The 2.3 billion people on the planet today that are following Jesus needed those 11 disciples to stay. And the over 5 billion people on the planet today that don't know the name of Jesus or haven't followed Jesus need you to stay and I to stay. He's given us a mission. The world needs us here. As you know, our influence, beyond seeing people coming to Christ, our influence makes this world a better place. If you're one of those people that looks at the world and thinks, oh, it's so awful, it's so bad, imagine if we weren't here. Our presence brings hope in a dark place. Jesus is the hope of the world, and he's chosen us to deliver that hope to the world. That's why we're still here. That's why we need protection. That's why we need to be united. That's why we need sanctification. Because we have a mission. You know, Jesus said in verse 19, he says, I did my part. I'm about to do my part. When he went to the cross, he says, I'm leaving them. I'm going to die. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, it says, he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. When we believe who Jesus is, when we understand what Jesus did, that should impact the way we live. Because Jesus gave his life for this mission. So that lost people, sinful people, you, me, everybody else in the world, to have a relationship with God, he gave his life for that. We should give our life to follow him and fulfill his mission. We need to pray that we'll be protected, that we'll be united, that we'll be sanctified because we're on mission with God. Using the language we've adopted around here, what this means is that we are engaged in striving to be a loving community, seeking, serving, sharing Jesus. And as we engage in that mission, it's going to be a battle. We're engaging the enemy. We're going into a world that is hostile. We're battling our own fears and doubts and difficulties at times. We're fighting our own temptations. So I want you to think for a moment, how do you pray? How do we pray for each other? What is it usually? Health, wealth, happiness? Aunt Millie's ingrown toenail. By the way, I respect ingrown toenails. I've had them. Don't want to belittle praying for those. Job promotions, better grades. Give me a boyfriend, give me a girlfriend. While some of these things are worthy of our prayers, I think we need to shift our focus a little bit. We need to understand why it's not natural for us to pray for protection, unification, and sanctification. Why isn't that the first thing we're praying for? Can I ask you, potentially, is it because we're not really engaged? We're not engaged in that battle out there. We're not on mission that Jesus sent us in the world to do? Is it possible we fit in too well with the world around us so there's no hating of us? D.A. Carson said this, the spiritual dimensions of this prayer of Jesus are consistent and overwhelming. By contrast, we spend much more time today praying about our health, our projects, our decisions, our finances, our family, and even our gains than we do praying about the danger of the evil one. Jesus prayed for those that are his because they were on mission for him. Let us join him in that prayer. Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for this opportunity to pray. Lord, I want to thank you for sending Jesus so that we could have a relationship with you and follow him. But, Lord, he's given us a mission. And, Lord, I want to pray over our church right now. I want to pray and ask you, Holy Father, to protect them. 
protect us. Father, we thank you that we don't have to engage this mission alone. We have all the resources of heaven behind us. Thank you, Lord, for that. We pray for protection in your great name and by your great power. Lord, we pray for unification. Lord, make us one. Help us set aside our differences continually and then use our uniqueness together to advance your mission. Lord, I pray for our sanctification. Help us, Lord, to be weird. Help us to be different. Help us to stand out. Help us to conform to the pa patterns of your word and not this world. Help us to be set apart and holy as we engage with people who sometimes will hate us, sometimes not understand us, sometimes not want to hear us, and Lord, at, at times even will do harsh and hurtful things to us. Lord, protect us, unify us, sanctify us. And we thank you that Jesus is saying that same prayer for us today, continually. In his precious name we pray.